Good evening everybody, good evening Women's Ed community, it is so nice to have you at our Women's Ed tonight, a place where women celebrate women. I'm your host for this evening because we're giving our lovely Rebecca the evening off because she's going to be presenting to us later. Um, it's lovely to see so many familiar names and faces popping up as our community strengthens over time. Um, well done for making some time for yourself this evening, uh, taking times out of your busy schedules where other things can overtake and investing some time in yourself. Feel free to put your cameras off, on, keep your cameras off, um, drink wine, drink coffee, relax, kick back. We're here to help you this evening take some time and think about yourself. Hello everybody, good evening. I am pleased to welcome the wonderful Amy Blair, who is the CEO and founder of uh, Batik Boutique. Um, amongst a busy family life with three beautiful children, two of which I have had the privilege of teaching, she has founded and leads a fabulous social enterprise selling the most gorgeous artisan products globally. So we're here tonight to find out her why and how we can take these practical tools forward into our own life journey. Uh, please welcome Amy Blair. Thank you. Thanks so much, Maddie. Yeah. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak to you. Um, I don't often get to speak to educators. And so for me, this is super fun um, because I love and respect all of you. And um, about half of the people in this uh, chat have probably taught at least one of my children. So um, yeah, so I, I have a lot of love and respect for all that you do, especially in this time. So hopefully tonight, some of what I can share can actually also um, not just share about my story with Bati Boutique, um, which I am I always love to do, but I'm hoping that maybe there's a takeaway for you as well that you can um, get something from this for yourself. So I'm gonna share my screen, which means that I can't see you anymore. Um, hold on. Okay, so I'll start with this. So um, yeah, I'm Amy, I'm the founder of Batik Boutique and we are a social enterprise based here in Malaysia. Um, and what I'm gonna talk to you tonight is about knowing your why and how a bit of my story of why developed and that actually um, led to me starting the Batik Boutique. Uh-oh, wait, yeah. 
Okay. So um, I moved to Malaysia actually 14 years ago. I know that's hard to believe because you all think I'm 25, but uh, I did move here 14 years ago. Um, and when I moved here, my husband and I were newlyweds and no children. And I was working in a tourism company um, and doing uh, like reviews for resorts and hotels and customer service. And he was doing an MBA. So we were not your typical expat coming here. I had a job here, yes, but it was a two-year contract. And like some of you, um, yeah, I've been here 14 years off my two-year contract. So um, I wanted to share with you kind of what made me stay in Malaysia. Um, so when I was here a couple of years, we decided to start a family and I took time off of my job to stay home with my two young boys at the time. And um, in that time, I think some of it was, um, you might have been through this yourselves. I was, a, I was working and then we moved here and then I stopped for a while to have a family. So for me, it was very weird to like not work, right? And I loved my children desperately and I loved and valued that time home with them. But at the same time, a few years into it, I started, you know, I'm a person who needs to do stuff. I'm a person who doesn't stay still or, you know, relaxing is like an activity for me to do something. So I needed to find something else to do um, a bit with my time. So I met this woman named Noor, who's in this photo beside me. Noor has seven children. I think there's five here, but she actually has seven now. And when I met Noor, she really just like rocked my world. Um, we were living in uh, Kota Damansara over by the curve at the time. And I did not understand how a woman in 2000 and something in Kuala Lumpur, where we had the Twin Towers and we had Starbucks on every corner, I did not understand how someone in this day and time could um, not have enough food for her family and could not um, have health care she needed and, and just opportunity as a Malaysian, as a Malaysian woman. So Noor and I became friends and Noor began to teach me Bahasa, Malaysia. So I boleh check out Bahasa Melayu, sikit, sikit. Um, so um, that became part of my story. And I started learning language actually just like as a hobby because I thought this is a good thing to use my brain for during nap time, right? When the kids were down sleeping. And I thought Bahasa was easier than Mandarin, so why not? Um, and as I began to learn language, I began to learn uh, Noor's heart. Anybody knows, you know, your first language, if you speak multiple languages, is um, your heart language. And so I began to understand her struggles as a mother. And the thing that I realized at the time is it was very obvious to me that at the end of the day, um, actually, we're really the same. So yes, you know, I'm about a foot taller than her, or I don't know. Oh, oh I'm in the British system. It's not a foot. It's I don't know how many CM that is, sorry. <laughs> I'm a lot taller than her. And um, we don't eat the same food always and we don't dress the same and sometimes we don't speak the same. But you know, end of the day, and if you've interacted with people as I know you have um, in other cultures because we're all here, um, you know that women are women, mothers are mothers. We all have the same intention and desire for our kids. And so I wanted to do something and at the time, I thought it was something like a charity, you know, something just whatever I could, something small. It was, this was not, I had no, I, I had no plans to create a global batik brand at the time. I didn't even know what batik was. Um, I didn't. Um, so anyways, I just wanted to help um, in little ways that I could. And so that's what I did. Um, today, though, um, fast forward, you know, seven or eight years later, um, and we've established what is the batik batik with the belief that women deserve fair and sustainable income and to be able to provide for themselves and their families. So for me, that's a huge part of my why is to create opportunity so that people can provide for their families. That is my why. Okay, so today, if you look at where this is, has progressed to, we actually have three retail outlets. As all good entrepreneurs do, we opened a new retail outlet um, the day after the MCO 3.0 here was announced. So. Whenever you you actually can come down to the row and see us because we're down at um, uh, Changkat now in Heritage Row and we've got our Sri Hartmas outlet and then uh, Dasaru in Johor. And how we ended up developing as a company, I, this is important to me to explain to you um, that I believe that people have the right to earn a fair wage and that they also earn, that they have a right to have dignified work. Yeah, so I just found out Noor's story, unfortunately, was too common. That Noor was not a one-off, that Noor was living in these flats where there was 1,000 families um, that all of a sudden I would go to their flats and just be overwhelmed with the reality that this was Malaysia, these were Malaysians, and these people had no real opportunity to work and they were living on welfare. So I really wanted to create something that was sustainable and something that could understand the life stage of mothers. Like, Anyone who's a mother knows if you give us like three hours, we can accomplish what people do in eight hours, right? We're, we're just like, you give us a little bit of time and we can like conquer the world. So I wanted to create um, an opportunity and a business for them. 
So now the other side of this is because my background was in tourism, I realized that there was a gap in the market for um, providing a quality gift or souvenir that's actually made in Malaysia. So I merged the two together. That's why we ended up using Batik was from that background. So we also sell on e-commerce. Um, last year was a major pivot for all businesses. It was really hard to be a business owner last year. Um, and we ship, we end up doing e-commerce a lot more, higher digital marketing, really pushed ourselves kind of where we weren't really ready to go, we had to, we were forced to because we had to close the boutiques, we had to close production. So we needed to be able to provide income for you know, these artisans who work with us. And um, we went to digital and what's amazing last year is we ended up shipping to 38 countries. Um, I'm still trying to recover from that one. And a big part of what we do for the sustainability side in terms of income production is we do corporate gifts. Now, most people don't know that about 70% of our revenue is actually not online or the stores. It's actually in producing these customized gifts. So if you or your spouse or your partner or your friend works for any kind of corporate, we do lawyer's office. We've done so many face masks. Um, get in touch with me because we'd love to help them like curate products that actually um, do good for the community and also are pretty and can be customized. One of the things that is important to me to do is to create this impact. And so we want to, we follow the UN um, sustainable development goals, which you may have heard of, of like no poverty, reduced inequalities, empowering communities. So every time we have an order from a corporate, we actually provide them an impacts report. So we end up, this is an example to show you something we did with Sephora, um, was telling them like, actually Sephora, when you ordered this, this is what you did. Um, in our company. And then uh, many of you know, maybe you've come whenever we've been able to host people, but we um, teach batik workshops as well. So that's just something to throw out there. If you've got visitors, one day we'll have visitors again, um, or you want an activity. Um, just last week, we did a corporate team building with 80 participants on their screens for Ernst & Young, which was like super cool to teach a batik workshop all in everybody's home. So the thing for me um, that I wanna share with you now, that, that's our story. Um, we are we are global now. We are you know we have three boutiques. We ship all around the world. Um, we create thousands and thousands of products a year. Um, but why do I do that? So for me, um, Simon Sinek. I don't know if any of you've heard of him. Uh, he's an American guy who is a little bit full of like ideas. But one of the things that really stands out for me is he talks about this um, this circle, right? This leadership circle where it's called the golden circle, where you draw like a why, how, and a what. So one of the things he says is that often people in your job, so if you're a teacher, let's say, often you know what you do. You know, you teach year three, you teach math, you know, you teach art, you know what you do, you know, you're the key stage head or whatever. Um, how you do it, people probably in leadership and all know how they do it. You know, what's, what's the mechanism, how they accomplish this, but very few people actually know why they do it. So the question that the, the what Simon says actually is a good leader and it um, would actually start with the why first, because often we start on the outside circle with our what, right? So um, that's the question I want to put out to you guys today. When you're thinking about this, like, yes, you're all educators. That's what this group is for. Why? Like really stop and think about that. Why did you get into teaching? You know, why, especially now, I think as we're sitting on screens and we're, you know, not interacting with humans, which is probably a, a lot of the reason you wanted to do what you do, but why, why do you do it? Yeah. So my question to you is to start with like, what is your why? Okay. So my why is that I wanted to create opportunity for people because I'm very much driven by injustice. I'm very much driven. I actually grew up in a home of poverty um, in, the, in the States. I grew up understanding what it was like to not have things I needed or wanted. And when I now saw that and recognized that, it actually pulls on my heartstrings. And I don't like things that are not right. I am American, I told you, <laughs> that are not fair. Um, and so that is very much, it drives me to want to, and I like to create not necessarily as a designer, though I do that now, but in my thoughts and in my um, plans, I like to create opportunity for others. So that's a huge part if you look at what I do with Bati Boutique. I also like to gift people. I like to give gifts. If you've ever been my friend, you know I give gifts to show you love. So it's not that strange that I actually created a company in hindsight about um, you know creating opportunity for women, for artisans to provide for their family that also is gifts. 
um, because that's a huge part of, of what I do. And then I wanted to involve other people to give you an opportunity to then support that cause while you live in Malaysia to, you know, to have something that you love from here, but that's also giving back to a community that's also benefiting others. So that's a bit of how I got, you know, to do what I do with ByTPT. So I hope that you can look him up. It's this golden circle, right? You can just Google his name if you've not, but there's, there's like worksheets and everything that will help you get to this. Um, so one of the questions is how do you find your why? And I think it's interesting because he says like, this is very practical now. Um, you make a list of three to five friends. He says like, you're good friends, not, and he also says, do not go to your family. Like, don't call your mom. Don't ask your husband or your spouse. Like, don't ask them. They're too close but just make a list of three to five friends, okay? And ask these people like, why are you friends with me? And that's really awkward because, you know, it's like, well, I like to hang out with you. Well, I like, you're cool to spend time with, we have fun. That's all very surfacey, and and that's where it's like, yeah, that's actually what all friends do together. You know, we all like to hang out with our friends, but why do you like to hang out with me, right? And so he talks about listening and then you wanna, um, you wanna clarify. So. It's a bit awkward and weird, but eventually, if you just keep asking the right questions, eventually someone will say something like, they'll turn it to themselves and they'll be like, yeah, I hang out with you because you make me feel heard. I, I like to be your friend because you inspire me to be a better person. You know, there's these reasons. So when you start hearing why people actually like to spend time with you and like to be with you, you take note of that and you clarify, and then um, you can compare. So everyone who would know me would tell you that I am an action person, like I like to take action. Um, it's probably why I've uh, been the class rep way too many times because someone didn't raise their hand after like a month and I was just so annoyed by it. Um, yeah, you know, when I'm like the one with the least amount of time, but I will just be like, okay, okay, I'll help the kids and the teacher. So, um, you know, but I am inspired by action. I'm inspired uh, to be better. That's something that people would say uh, is, is what they know about me. So that's the question is like, that will help you kind of find your why. And then eventually you can develop a statement like, so what's your why? So it could be about, um, you know, you don't all exist just to teach. Like there's something deeper to that. It could be related to your career. It doesn't always have to be related to your career. You know, it could be to, um, like mine is to create opportunities so that people have options to provide for their families. Like that's like, that's my why statement in this. Yours could be to, um, to show compassion so that people are loved, you know, to um, inspire children so that they can achieve their potential. You see, this is how this works. And what I want to share is like this past like two years, I would say year, but it's about, you know, we're entering our second year of COVID, right? We're entering our second year of this like really challenging time. And if you've been a business owner, it's extremely challenging because I need you to understand at the end of the day, like my salary is not guaranteed, right? Like if we don't have income coming in, it doesn't come out. Um, I need you to understand that when my kids are e-schooling at home, you know, I still have to go to work to try to figure this out. We're not sitting on the screen beside them, you know? Um, my father actually passed away of COVID um, in, in February, which is why I couldn't join you earlier. Um, that's like, extremely hard stuff to go through, right? My husband lost his job last year um, from, from uh, prices reducing in oil and gas, you know? These are all very real things. And everybody in, in this room has a story, um, unfortunately related to COVID probably and things outside of our control. You know, you've got mental health issues happening. You've got, um, you know, distant, you haven't seen family in a long time and all this stuff is very real. Um, you got told by the government that tomorrow you have to teach at home, okay. Um, and you're having to pivot and you're having to adjust and it's hard because um, we don't like having to do this, right? But when you know your why, it helps you center yourself, right? It helps you come back to say, you know what, end of the day, yes, all those things are very real that have happened in my life. All those things in your life are very real, but what am I still going to be about, right? What am I, am I still going to be about creating opportunity so people have the option to like have fair and and decent work, yeah. So one of the things we did in this past year was stretch ourselves like no other. We ended up sewing PPE gear. We ended up sewing over 15,000 pieces um, for medical personnel. We got special permission to open during the lockdown um, in a very like sanitized way so that I could still provide income to women from the flats. And we've sewed 
I don't know how many thousands of face masks. So thank you for anyone who's ever bought our face mask because you're keeping people at work, you're keeping people employed. Um, and so that was our pivot, was having to stretch and be part of the solution in Malaysia and not just moaning or be part of the problem. And that's what I, I think is really important as we go through this next, this year, it is challenging. We're tired, we're discouraged. We all wanna travel. I mean, hello, we all miss our families. Um, we're tired of staring at screens. Can't believe we're all on a screen right now together, but here we are. And it's gotta be something that centers you to know why you're doing this, right? And I just wanna end with like this encouraging fact for me. So when you, when you know your why, and when you choose choices that support your why, then your why becomes your reality. So for me, if you had told me when I first met Noor, just coming to my house to drop off, you know, a three scarves that she sewed, that I just paid her whatever she told me for, and I gave it to my mom for Christmas or something. If you would tell me that, you know, seven years later, Amy, you would have employed 200 artisans, you'll have trained 100 women who had no job training before, and you would have created as a company over a million handmade products. I mean, like, that's like funny, right? Um, but that's the reality. That's the reality of what can happen when um, you you find out, you know, what you're passionate about, what, what your why is, and um, how you can do something about that. So um, that's my current team. I'm ending on this note because this is our beautiful boutique that we just opened. Um, and you're all welcome to come to it as soon as you want to get out of your house. Um, and we are just raising up a generation of uh, Malaysians who want to take Malaysian batik globally, and we want to do it for a good cause. And so I hope that um, Mayan story can inspire you a bit and uh, that you can think through for yourselves, like, what is it about what you do? Because what you do is important. What you do matters. Um, what you do has purpose to it. And I hope that, um, you know, that can be some takeaway for you tonight. Can yeah, I have a question there. I'm really oh. curious to know, Amy, you seem to have stumbled into <laughs> Batik Boutique, if that would be right to say. Um, just some things I really liked from the presentation. I just think it's so admirable the way that you chose to learn the Bahasa uh, language. Um, I love the way that even though you and Nur had so many differences that you found relationships in likeness um, despite your differences. Um, I love that your love language is gifts. I'm sure your friends love, love being friends with you because of that. And I love the fact that you recognize that everyone has a story because it's so easy for us to be judgmental, judge other people's behaviors or actions without actually understanding the story that they walk or have walked in their past. And we are all products of our situations, our experiences and our circumstances. So I loved that. But I was, I was wondering as you sat kind of stumbled in to, um, to this, what would you have done perhaps if you, when you were younger, what did you dream of doing? What was your dream? Um, well, I went from, I wanted to be a housewife to I wanted to be a teacher to I wanted to be corporate. <laughs> so, <laughs> I think I landed in university after I was ready to go that's, corporate. That's really interesting. You never yeah. really- Yeah, I don't know. I, I like hit the, the whole spectrum. And admired business entrepreneur that you are today then. Yeah. And what about your children, Amy? How do you manage to run a business, <laughs> uh, cope with family life, being a wife and a mother and an entrepreneur all at once? I mean, what are your tips for our, our ladies here tonight about juggling multiple things in their life? Well, I think if anybody's told you that you can have it all, that's a, that's a lie. So um, you can have a lot of things. And you can, uh, but you need to make priorities and everything is a trade-off, right? So like if I choose, so I don't have a lot of free time. Does that make sense? So in my free time, I do things with my kids, you know, or I do, you know, I, I don't uh, do some of the things I used to anymore, um, but I'm choosing that, right? So we all have the same amount of time in a day um, and you make trade-offs for that. I'm very fortunate that even when, uh, my husband actually works in our company now by, by default um, from last year. Uh, but before that, when he didn't, um, he was always supportive of us. And, and I think Malaysia is one of these places that's a great place because you know we have a helper and we have, you know, you, we, I have a lot of systems in place because I have to. So the only thing that goes wrong is when some, you know, when there's a sick child or there's a pandemic, how about that one? The pandemic is really not helping out my, uh, my balance of anything, I'll just tell you. But uh, 
you know, when there's things out, like we build the system and we follow, we've got a good rhythm. It's just when those normal things that kids do, you know, they get sick. I mean, goodness. And they, they just like act crazy some days. Right. And they don't listen to you on one day and like, okay. Um, that's the stuff that where it just becomes a challenge and you just start realizing like everything's a trade-off. So you can have a lot of things, uh, but you can't actually have everything. That's great. Thank you for that. Um, we have got a couple more questions come, come oh, up. Oh yeah, I'll chat. type it in. It's Simon. Um, but maybe you can answer those within the chat. I've just got a, a question. I want to know what it's like working with your husband because I love my husband. He's amazing. I love him as a person. He's so wonderful, but I don't ever think we could work together. How do you find I'm that? I'm not sure if you can hear me in the other room right now, but uh, no, he, when he didn't work with me, I was wanting him to work with me. And I used to try to make him feel guilty about like, why don't you come work with me with this family business we have? Da, da, da. And now when he works with me, I'm like, are you sure that you don't want to apply for something else? So I'll tell you a funny story is that we just moved into a new office as well. We just expanded our office. Like literally we moved in like two weeks ago and it was the first time we ever sat down with like designers and contractors to build out a space. Right. And it was so fun to do, like do that together. We were picking out, you know, furnishing and all this stuff. And I realized like he put his office right beside mine. And I finally just looked at him one day and I said, honey, like, I love you. I ride to work with you. I do all these things, right? But I'm going to need to put the meeting room in between my office and yours. Like, I'm just going to need a little bit of space. Okay. So he understood it. It was just that that's our personalities is he's super like introvert, want to be with me all the time. And I'm like, where'd my friends go? You know? <laughs> so um, yeah, lots of conversation and uh, understanding along the way. Yeah, I'm sure that sounds great. Right, thank you. Thank you so much.